Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we proudly bring to you Mormonism Live! Shut up and sit down. Good evening, uh, everyone. Good evening, Merry Mr. Christmas. Real. How are you? Merry Christmas to you, too. You've got a festive scarf on. Yes. We're in a jacket. This too. is the chain I forged in life, link by link and yard by yard. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone. Yes. Playing the part of Tiny Tim tonight will be Bill Real. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm full of goodwill and cheer. I love it. Is it cold there? Among other things. <laughs> okay. But uh, it is so cold here. It is bitter cold, and I am sick at heart. <laughs> yeah, I'm coming over a little bit of a cold, too. Hope I'm not contagious if I sneeze that way. <laughs> oh, oh, wait. Oh, <laughs> we're going to have to work on this better. Yeah. Yes, Bob Cratchit. I feel like Bob Cratchit. Or as you put it before we went live, Bob Crotch shot. <laughs> Oh, boy. All right. Well, um, before we jump into our not-so-Christmas special, um, mm. we are here at December 21st. We've got a few more days until Christmas. Uh, challenge for everybody out there. You know, I obviously would uh, maybe do the donation plea, but I'll combine it with a bunch of other things and give all of you a choice. Even though Mormonism took away your free agency here at Mormonism Live, we are deep believers in it. Um, folks, if you will consider doing one thing tonight, if you will either um, subscribe to the program if you haven't, uh, send us a donation if you'd like to do it that way. You can go to mormonismlive.org. Uh, otherwise, if you will either go on to Apple, uh, if you listen to your podcast there and give us a review, or if you will take your favorite episode of Mormonism Live and share it somewhere on social media, that would be the Christmas present you could give me this year, and I would be thrilled if you would do one of those things. Uh, any thoughts from you, RFM? Yes, a five-star review, hopefully. And as you probably noticed, as long as you do any one of those four things that benefit us, yes, your free agency will remain intact. Yes, you you must do it. <laughs> uh, sounds like Elder Bednar. So tonight we thought we would, you and, and we should say, I mean, maybe you can go into this for a moment if you'd like to, RFM, but why are we covering a talk by Sherry Dew tonight? Well, the only reason that we are doing this is because we have received requests from listeners that we do so. Otherwise, it might have escaped our review. I had looked at it. I don't think I really listened to the whole thing previously. It is, oh, it was given in November, I think early November at BYU Hawaii it, this year, 2022. But a lot of people have been wanting us to review it. So we are obliging as always. We are your servants. We do as you want us to do as long as we feel like it. Yes, we've gotten a lot of requests over the years, and we don't do most of them simply because it's not super interesting to you and I in the moment of what other people find interesting. But um, we certainly appreciate, I mean, I would welcome listeners to send us requests. We have picked up a few of those, and like tonight, here we are covering this talk by Sherry Dew, which I think there's a there's a lot here, uh, a lot to go into. And so, uh, no pun intended, Book of Mormon, but without further ado... Uh, we'll jump into it. RFM, you've got the first Mormon one. Stories? Oh, you're What's talking about Book of Mormon. You're talking about Book of Mormon and Jacob. About I the word bid I you adieu. Oh, I thought you were talking about Mormon stories, how John DeLynn always says, and without any further ado. No, no, no. I wasn't making any jokes about Mormon stories. Rather, the Book of Mormon anachronism. Adieu. Okay, well, no John DeLynn cracks tonight, Mr. Real, okay? If you I'm, please, sir. If you please. Yeah, I'm always the one doing those, huh? <laughs> so yeah take us through you've got the first time stamp uh oh. there's a story in there about getting out of debt 
Well, yeah, and we should probably say what the heck the title of her talk was, which was about prophets see around corners. And really what this is, is a rehash of the basic ideas, the fundamental principles of modern Mormonism regarding prophets and how you need to do what they say, regardless of whether you disagree with it, whether it leaves you in tears, whether, whether it leaves you fuming for six months. And we'll get to that, believe me, boy, will we get to that by the end of the show. You always follow the prophet, but she peppers it with a number of miracle stories where she claims that they show that prophets see around corners, i.e. prophets can see the future, i.e. they're actually prophets in that they can prophesy. And these end up being pretty weak sauce. But in spite of their weakness, as far as miracle stories, a little bit of digging and research on our part found a number of interesting things, which we'll be sharing with the audience tonight. Yeah, it's yes, going to be will. exciting. I'm not even going to say it, Bill. You know, it's going to be exciting. Uh, I, I'm really excited because this tends to happen. You and I uh, really, I think, thrill people, and a lot of people have said as much, when you and I get together and we take talks by church leaders or a talk like this and dissect it, and there certainly are several sound bites that will give us plenty of meat tonight. So, Yes, and we can't cover everything. Otherwise, we would be here for like seven or eight hours, and it would be like a Mormon Stories episode. Yeah, and we, we just want to get in and out of here. <laughs> Absolutely. We're just going to cover some of the highlights. We're going to have some fun at Sherry Dew's expense. And uh, hopefully, hopefully we can get through this by nine o'clock your time. Okay, so uh, she gives a number of stories. One of the first stories that we want to look at has to do with how it was that she took a prophet's advice who could see around corners and see the financial collapse is too strong a word, recession of 2008 coming and not only like a week before but 10 years before and she tells a story and how she acted on prophetic uh insight and foresight and she was much the better for it Excellent. prophets help us see dangers we cannot yet see and opportunities we can't even imagine i have experienced this myself in the october 1998 general conference President Gordon B. Hinckley admonished members to get out of debt. I felt that I should try to pay off my home, but my accountant told me I was crazy to even think about it because the interest rate on my mortgage was so low. Nonetheless, I finally decided to take President Hinckley at his word and just do it. It took some scrimping for several years, but I managed to pay off the loan. Now, skip ahead to the fall of 2008, exactly 10 years after President Hinckley's warning about debt, when the U.S. economy was suddenly plunged into a recession. I was still the CEO of Deseret Book at that time, and our sales plummeted. I was worried sick about saving jobs and, frankly, about saving the company. But one evening, as I drove home with the all-too-familiar pit in my stomach, it dawned on me that despite all the pressure I was under, I wasn't worried at all about myself. I owned my own home, and I owed no money, all because I had followed a prophet's counsel 10 years earlier. A prophet helped me see around the corner. It was 10 years ago on a night just like tonight. <laughs> no, so um, this is remarkable because apparently there was a prophet, I didn't remember this, but there was a church leader who encouraged members to get out of debt. I didn't know that that had ever happened in general conference until Sherry Dew brought it up. Of course I kid, because it, it used to be you couldn't swing a dead cat without hitting a church leader talking about getting out of debt. <laughs> and. <laughs> get your food little storage, wings. get out of debt, all the things that us good Mormons were told to do. Right. Well, apparently this particular talk by President Hinckley uh, made an impact on Sherry Dew, though. And so, you know, I've got to I've got to step back for a second and think I'm glad that she got out of debt with her mortgage. Obviously, she had no debt other than the mortgage. She gets uh, out of debt with her mortgage in the space of 10 years, just in time to avoid the recession. Uh, she doesn't avoid it. She just doesn't have a mortgage at the time the recession hits because she followed this prophet's counsel. Now, I did have a mortgage at the time the, uh, the recession hit. 
Uh, fortunately, I have no mortgage anymore because I own no real property. So yeah, two divorces will take care of that for a person. <laughs> right. <laughs> but anyway, um, that's one thing. The second thing is this, is that she's a CEO of Deseret Book. And I've got to think that's more than minimum wage. I'm just guessing here. Okay, Bill, what do you think? She is the liaison between the church leadership and what stuff they sell at their bookstore. And as such, I consider her to be very high up. She's not a general authority, although she has served in those kinds of positions before. She's not a general authority. Um, but being the head person at the Deseret Book Company uh, is no small matter uh, when it comes to, to church uh, hierarchy. Well, right. Women cannot be general authorities per se. She's certainly been a general officer in the Relief Society. And that's what I mean. In the past. Yeah. So she's gone as high as a person can go in this church yeah. without a PP. So that's something to be said. Also, she's quite famous for never having been married. She has no children. And the only reason I bring that up is because one of the reasons that most of us can't pay off our mortgage in 10 years is because we have expenses related to all the children that we are encouraged to have by the leaders of the church. Yeah. So the leaders of the church kind of set up this system where we pay them 10% off the top. Then we got to have all these children. Then we've got to take care of the children, which costs a lot of money. So the, the deck was kind of stacked against me as trying to be as faithful a Mormon as I knew how to be of paying off my mortgage. Maybe I could have, I don't know. Maybe I should have taken this more seriously. I don't know. But one thing I do know is that when I went back, cause I thought, you know, she's pinpointed the general conference when this talk was given by president Hinckley and I can go back and I can probably find it. And I did. Now, the first thing to note about this general conference address is that he did not tell the members to get out of debt. And I say that because he was speaking not in a general session of general conference. He was speaking in the priesthood session of general conference. And it's not addressed to the women. So what I'm saying is it's not addressed to Sherry Dew. It is specifically addressed and titled to the boys and to the men. And remember, you're talking to. Yeah. And remember, this is before Kate Kelly got them to change the procedures and allow women to come and attend. This was back in the day when they would block the door and women were adamantly told to stay home. And President Nelson probably had his wife and daughters making him cookies back then. Yeah, it was Donut City. Donut Absolutely. City. <laughs> By the way, I think Kate Kelly, I don't think she got uh, women to attend, but she got them to broadcast it live so women could watch could attend. Yes, not not attend the actual session in Salt Lake City, but rather now they could go into their cultural hall and watch it with the priesthood brethren. Okay, right, right. So she couldn't be in attendance. She couldn't watch this live. She could read about it afterwards, certainly in the, the published conference address or issue of the enzyme. The conference report is the expression I was looking for. But it's to the boys and to the men. It's by President Gordon B. Hinckley, First half of the talk is talking to the boys about going on missions. Second half of the talk is to the men about getting out of debt. And he says a number of very interesting things in this. Let me pull this up here on my outline. And just Please as you're noting, you. too, as you're looking for that, yes. she's talking, or it's not she, President Hinckley is talking to the males in the church. This isn't counsel for her anyway. No, it's not. But I know she's kind of the head of the house because she's not married. I don't fault her for taking this advice. I do. Well, what I'm trying to point out is that she's skewing this just a little bit in the retelling in her talk in order to make it sound like it could be applicable to her or more applicable to her than it was in its original giving by President Hinckley. Yeah. So we can go to this first clip from timestamp 838 to 850. You'll hear what I'm talking about when he's shifts from talking to the boys to talking to the men. Do we have that, Maven? Now, brethren, I should like to talk to the older men, hoping that there will be some lesson for the younger men as well. I wish to speak to you about temporal matters. Oh, wait a second. Wait a second. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Now I'm interrupting. I wish to speak to you about temporal matters. Right. So he's talking to the older men because, of course, from his point of view, they're the ones who are in charge of making the money 
so that they can use it correctly after paying the tithing to get out of debt. And the thing that really That's struck how patriarchy me works. Yeah. You know, and in a way, Sherry Dew is well, she's she's complicated in that she is a living embodiment that defies patriarchy at the same time as everything she says seems to slavishly submit to the patriarchy that she defies. Yeah. And she Any thoughts about that, Bill. She benefits from that, right? Like she's a female inside a patriarchy and the way that women tend to hold power in patriarchies is by lifting up the men in power. And so by her showing loyalty and obedience and reiterating everything they say and agreeing with it at all times, she sets herself up as the, as a possible higher uh, ranking woman inside a patriarchy. Well, she's certainly a very, very high ranking and powerful woman within the LDS church. I'm not sure I can remember of one as high ranking or as powerful as she with everything she's done. And the remarkable thing is she does it when she's not married. Yeah. I cannot think of any GA who gets to their position without being married. It's like a, it's a requirement for the job. I believe, I mean, a Bishop in the church has to be married. Yeah. So the thing that was interesting is that um, there's a lot of things that are interesting, but President Hinckley back in 1998, when he's giving this talk, he goes through and reads from Genesis chapter 41 about Joseph and the, the dream that he interprets of the, the seven years of plenty and the seven years of famine. But then after reading it, he makes it clear. Remember, Sherry Dew is positioning this as seeing around corners that President Hinckley is seeing the future. He's exercising his prophetic gifts. And yet when I go back and actually look at the talk itself, I find that President Hinckley is specifically disavowing prophesying. He says, I'm not prophesying here. I want everybody to understand that I'm not prophesying. Do we have that clip from 1040 to 1057? To... Now, brethren, I want to make it very clear that I am not prophesying, that I'm not predicting years of famine in the future, but I am suggesting that the time has come to get our houses in order. Okay, so having made it clear that he's not prophesying, maybe this is why you're not supposed to go back and look at the talks that are being referenced. But he's making it clear it's, he's not prophesying, he's not predicting bad things happening. The second thing that's happened here is that Sherry Dew is casting this as if 2008 is the only recession or only bad economic time that the church has ever experienced. Obviously, there would be the Great Depression. We all understand that. But in recent times, in our in Sherry Dew's lifetime. And yet, President Hinckley is not speaking about this in a vacuum. Back in 1998, there are problems with the economy that he specifically references in this talk and that obviously form the reason for his giving so much time to this topic in General Conference priesthood session in 1998 and he talks about that at timestamp 1105 to 1135 we have witnessed in recent weeks wide and fearsome swings in the markets of the world the economy is a fragile thing a stumble in the economy in jakarta or moscow can immediately affect the entire world it can eventually reach down to each of us as individuals. There is a portent of stormy weather ahead to which we had better give heed. Okay, and now we're gonna have, I'm sorry, Bill, did you wanna say anything? Yeah, just a, a couple of things here. Um, one is, one is that you know, the church, as a church leader, these guys are in meetings all the time with folks who are helping them manage the church's money and helping them to uh, sense kind of where the world's at and where things are going. It would not be out of the realm of rational and reasonable that President Hinckley and other members of the top 15 would have a recognition that there are some economic little blips that are happening just as uh, as the economy is beginning to get inflated right as um that 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 uh, recession that comes in 10 years you can kind of sense that we Americans in this moment of the late 90s we were 
overspending a little bit. We were, um, you know, pl- placing money in and buying homes and um, maybe going a little in over our heads doing that. And oh, that was uh, a time of flipping houses and buying on margin in the stock market. Yes. Um, and to recognize that he would have had experts in the financial fields around him. If you go back to the videos that Ryan McKnight le- uh, leaked out with Mormon leaks, you can see several leadership meetings where they are brought uh, up to date. They are given information on the current structure of this of the uh, financial uh, markets. They're they're given advice on uh, what things to be aware of that are kind of coming that they may not see. Things to give be heads up, kind of uh, on their mind. And it's it's kind of this crazy idea that as a member of the church, I used to think these prophets were these men, these top fifteen were. Uh, just brilliant, right? If they came up with something that was close to a hit, we I didn't have any other reason to explain it other than their prophet seers and revelators. But I'm simply wanting to say, you know, re- recognize that these men have smart men around them, especially when it comes to their money, the church's money, to make sure that that is invested wisely and that it captures every possible cent of interest and increase that it can. Right. And I want to say that Fred Lors or Lords, L-O-R-Z, makes a great comment here because what happened in 2008 was that this, it wasn't just the stock market. It was the uh, the real estate market crashed and real estate values took a nosedive at the time. And what Fred says is with a paid off house in 2008, Ms. Du bore the full brunt of the 30 percent drop in home values. Actual prophecy would tell you to sell in 2007 and buy back in 2010. So that is a great, great point. Thank you, Fred. That's all I wanted to share was that comment. So I'll I'll come back off the screen. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. And I'm glad you put it up there and left it up there because I did want to mention that. That's a great point. Because she bought her house and had it all paid off, she took a 30% hit in the value of her house. Now, it certainly wasn't upside down. She didn't have that problem, but she did lose 30% of the value at the time. So that's what following a prophet can get you. Anyway, there was something else that I had wanted to mention here. I think that was the first thing. Oh, yes. Now he talks about mortgages on a house. And by he, I mean President He. But he specifically excludes your house mortgage from what he's talking about. Because obviously, pretty much everybody, unless they're a CEO with no kids, has to have a mortgage on their house. It's hard to find all that money just to put down to buy a house for the full price. And on timestamp 1455 to 1518, he makes that clear and then says a very, very important thing at the very end, the last sentence of this clip. Necessary to borrow to get a home, of course, but let us buy a home that we can afford and thus ease the payments which will constantly hang over our heads without mercy or respite for as long as 30 years. No one knows when emergencies will strike. Boom. No one knows when emergencies will strike. So in addition to mentioning mortgages as being the only acceptable kind of debt, note that he first says he is not prophesying or predicting a famine or something bad coming, but he follows it up by saying he doesn't know when emergencies will strike. He says, no one knows when emergencies will strike. And I would presume that that would include President Hinckley. So he's saying everything he possibly can to make it clear that he is not seeing into the future or seeing around corners. And this allows President Hinckley to make such a statement with no concerns about it not coming to pass and therefore being argued as a false prophet. But Sherry Dew can now turn around 10 years later, and of course now it's much later that she's making this talk, but Sherry Dew can now turn around and call him a true prophet for something he specifically said he wasn't prophesying. Your thoughts, Bill? Yeah, um, a couple things. One is that I went and looked up when recessions have happened Recessions occurred in the early 2000s. That was March 2001 to November 2001. There's the Great Recession, which they're talking about here, December 2008 to June 2009. There was a recession during COVID um, 
February 2020 to April 2020, which, by the way, Maven, if you have uh, the thing from President Nelson, here was a perfect chance to have a prophet who sees uh, into the future, and um, it didn't quite happen. Sisters, as we welcome you to this historic April 2020 General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, for reasons you know, I stand before you in an empty auditorium. Little did I know when I promised you at the October 2019 General Conference that this April conference would be memorable and unforgettable. That speaking to a visible congregation of fewer than 10 people would make this conference so memorable and unforgettable for me. So I think it's I think it's interesting that she wants to tout this moment where President Hinckley is clear that he's not prophesying, but that he is aware that the economy is experiencing some strange blips, and he's advising the members to get out of debt and to be prepared. I want to note that there was a Great Depression in the, you know, 19, what is it, 1930? And... Uh, 29, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. And... I know that my grandfather was alive during that, and he spoke about how hard things were. I don't think anything from church leaders ever saw that coming. There was hard times during the 60s, during the 70s, during the 80s. I know my parents, when they bought their first house, their interest rate was like 14.5%. Thank you, Jimmy Carter. Yes. And and so to notice that there is always going to be blips in the economy. If, you, if, a, if some got buddy says... Hey, I think the economy is going to have a hard, a hard time here soon. Sometime in the next decade, someone's going to be able to go, see, I told you so. And the recognition that there have been really hard moments in the past, namely the Great Depression, for which LDS leaders saw nothing. Here was COVID, and President Nelson admits, I told you there'd be a special conference because we're going to wave our flags in the air, the three of us, our little, our little handkerchiefs. But what we didn't know, as he said, quote, little did I know, he didn't. And, and so it's it seems to be very convenient, kind of a, uh, what is it, a Texas sharpshooter, when the church ends up kind of looking back with hindsight and saying, oh, yeah, that was probably more of a prophecy than President Hinckley let on. Well, that's cheating the system. President Hinckley said clearly it's not a prophecy. Right, absolutely. And even in the face of this, we have people who are insisting on trying to find ways to show that President Nelson actually did see the pandemic coming, in spite of the fact that he never mentioned anything about it. And he very clearly said, I had no idea that this pandemic was coming or that the reason that it was gonna be so special in April, 2020 is because I'm going to be addressing an empty room. Because of course, for people like 50 or 100 years from now who are watching this, yeah, nobody could be there because no one could gather together because of the pandemic. So they, they broadcast it and everybody had to watch it from their, their home or wherever they might be. They couldn't be gathering together in the conference center like they, like they had the October before. But <clears throat> so you've got Wendy Nelson, President Nelson's wife, who tells a story about how one day in early 2020, very early 2020, she looks on the, the whiteboard and Apparently, President Nelson has canceled all their speaking engagements for the year without telling anybody, or at least not telling her. And she says, why? Why did you do that? And he says, well, I just felt like, yeah, we don't need to do that. Wow. Her, her conclusion from that is, yes, there's a, there's a prophet in the land because he saw this coming. In spite of the fact he never told anybody, and when he had a chance to talk about it, at the beginning of conference, April 2020, he says, I had no clue. But she's going to force it on him. And Sherry Dew is going to do the same thing in a, in a part of this talk, a story that we're not going to have time to go into in depth. It's the first story she tells in this address from BYU Hawaii, which is cell phones. That cell phones have been worked on for missionaries, smartphones, since apparently 2013, when they started doing pilot programs. Early January, they go worldwide and boom, the recession, not the recession hits, boom, the pandemic hits. And so this shows that he can see around corners, right? He could see the future because not only does he cancel all the appointments per Wendy, which I don't believe in the first place, but
but now all the missionaries get cell phones in January of 2020, and that shows that he saw the pandemic coming. It's really interesting how when something big happens, if you've got leadership in your church, whatever that church is, that you feel has the ability to see the future or can interpret the Bible in such a way as to predict the future accurately, and something big happens, and there's been nothing, nobody predicted it, but they should have, if they really are who we believe they are, then the process starts and people start scurrying around and trying to find little crumbs here and little crumbs there to make it look like really they could see it coming in spite of the fact they never mentioned anything about it. Yeah, there were thousands of things that if a prophet knew that a pandemic was coming would have prepared uh, for such. Um, and to be honest, to have Hinckley, if, if Hinckley had any indication that that was coming, and the best he did was a couple of paragraphs in a general conference talk and priesthood session, then then we dropped the ball there too. I I just wanted to point out this uh, comment by Camille, who um, she has a Mormon story. She worked in the church office building um, for, uh, she was a secretary to, I think, apostles, or it might have been some lower general authorities. I'm so sorry, Camille, I forgot. But anyway, this is insider information, so I just wanted to point out her comment. Uh, they had no idea about COVID, uh, um, the chaos inside the COB. If the uh, chaos inside the COB was any indication, they were scrambling for a plan and laptops and anything so that everyone could work from home. Yeah. So, hmm. Last minute preparation. Why does do tell that story? Why yeah, doesn't Wendy helpful. Watson, Nelson tell that story? Yeah. See, we're only getting one side of the story, and the side that we're getting is warped beyond recognition. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The uh, the second one you've got here is... Oh, there was one other thing I wanted oh, to please. say about that. There was one other yeah, clip. Please. I'm sorry. No, we're going to keep you here till past nine. Oh, That's my goal now, an official. Okay. <laughs> but um, remember, uno momento, por favor. Uh, remember that Sherry Dew talks about how she took time to pay off her mortgage and she was so glad she did. And what she does is she ends up patterning her story. I'm not saying her story's made up. I'm just saying that she ends up telling a story that looks an awful lot like the same story that President Hinckley told about President Faust back in 1998, who did the same thing. And this is why he whistles while he works. Self. Perhaps I can tell it, and he can take it out on me afterwards. <laughs> he had a mortgage on his home, drawing 4% interest. Many people would have told him he was foolish to pay off that mortgage when it carried so low a rate of interest. But the first opportunity he had to inquire some means, he and his wife determined they would pay off their mortgage. He's been free of debt since that day. That's why he wears a smile on his face. <laughs> and that's why he whistles while he works. There we go. So that's really the big story about paying off your mortgage. It was certainly an exception to the rule that he wanted to tell about President Faust. And I think it's a, I think it's a great story. It's a wonderful story. It just really sounds an awful lot like Sherry Dew's story. Yeah, and one wonders uh, about what year it was that President Faust came into some money. I wonder if that's the year he joined the Quorum of the Twelve. Oh, wow. Yeah. And wow. Then, just speaking of, of privilege, um, RFM, you pointed this out before, too, but um, this wasn't an Elder Faust story, but it was in Sherry's that it was her accountant who told her that she was crazy for doing this. And I just, we both thought it was kind of funny to, I guess just kind of point out the privilege involved when you are able to afford a personal accountant to even tell you that you're being crazy. Um, that's something uh, I don't think that the uh, saints that Nelson spoke to in Africa, when he was telling them to pay the church tithing before feeding their families, um, I don't think they had personal accountants that they could, um, you know, ask about that. Just saying. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for adding that. I remember that we did talk about that. It, it is interesting. She's a CEO. She has no dependents and she has an accountant. So I think it's great that she paid off her mortgage. I'm just saying that um, it's, it has nothing to do with the profit seeing around the corner. That's my yeah. basic.
conclusion here. Now, the no corners story seen you, around. No corners seen around here. No. So the second story that we're going to talk about has to do with um, two years ago. By the way, does everybody remember that two years ago in November was the big speech, the televised speech, the worldwide address that President Nelson gave? Uh, we are almost a year into COVID, this massive pandemic causing this worldwide upheaval economically, socially, you name it. And he decides that he's going to give an 11 minute address about being thankful. And what he says is, I'm just going to mention this because I went back. Remember, we did a show on this two years ago. I went back and I listened to it to refresh my memory. And what he does is he says, OK, for the seven days leading up to Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving was on the 27th of November, two years ago. He airs an address on the 20th, which was the Friday before. And he says, starting today, I want you to use social media to express your gratitude for something that you have every day of the seven days leading up to Thanksgiving and including Thanksgiving and use that hashtag, give thanks. Remember that one, Bill? Yep. Okay. Well, Sherry is going to give us the inside scoop on how it was that that happened. And I'm just going to let you listen to it. Then we're going to talk about it a little bit more and see if you think this qualifies as a prophet seeing around a corner. Two years ago, I saw President Russell M. Nelson see something I could not see. On September 17, 2020, I was among those invited to a communications meeting with President Nelson. The pandemic was raging, and we suggested to President Nelson that he record a message of hope for church members. He told us to, quote unquote, sprinkle a little fertilizer on that idea and bring it back to him the following week. But then the very next day, President Nelson asked to meet with our group again. He told us that our idea wasn't bad, it just wasn't right. During the night, he had received the impression that he should indeed record a message, but a message for the world, not just members. He said his message should be about gratitude and include a prayer for the world. He told us the exact day and time the video should be released and even how long it should be. I had never heard President Nelson be so specific about communication details, but as he spoke, I knew that I was witnessing a prophet act on revelation. We assembled a team of videographers and others to fulfill President Nelson's instructions. If this group had relied on their own expertise, they would have never re recommended a video as long as the one President Nelson specified nor would they have suggested releasing it on a Friday, the worst day to release one. But a prophet had spoken, and so we went to work. The result was the hashtag Give Thanks video released on November 20th, 2020. And the results? Unprecedented. That video's reach dwarfed anything the church had ever released, especially to those not of our faith. Never in the history of the earth had so many people heard a prophet's voice. Prophets see around corners. So, so I have some that story. David has joined us. Yes, yeah. David. I have a couple things to share. Um, so I uh, so I spoke with uh, Anthony and Breeze, who uh, I was actually a consultant uh, with the church on YouTube and content strategy uh, previously. And so uh, there are some analytics that I will share um, uh, about that campaign. So this right here is, uh, it, so just to explain it, we can see two lines here on the graph. One is purple and it's basically at the bottom. It's flatlined there, if you guys can see, uh, or if you're wondering where it is, it's flatlined. And then there's this blue line that goes up. So this is the analytics for that Give Thanks video seven days after publishing. So in this legend here, we can see that purple line that's basically flat at the bottom represents the typical views the church gets after seven days. And at, at this point, it's 12,757 to about 19,847 views average. Whereas this video 
was like enormously high, 7,264,038 views seven days after publishing. And on the next slide, this is 28 days after publishing. So again, the church's average is a little bit higher, 28 days after versus seven, but not that much. It's 15,261 to about 22,222 views average 28 days after a video is published but this one the uh, give thanks campaign is at 12 million 135 thousand nine hundred and eight views um so that curve looks really familiar by the way does it yeah just i'll show you something so this is our episode number 42 on the 1886 john taylor revelation this is what we get normally as an episode is released right down there. I don't know what that number is, but let's see, 6,000, right? So it goes up in the first day. Remember our day one when, we, when we'd go, we'd get four, five, six, seven thousand. 7,000. But by the time it was whatever days in, it had like 8,200. And then suddenly I paid for some advertising uh, to try to get this a little more reach. And it wasn't much. We paid like, I don't know, 50 bucks or something. And notice the curve, and I'll put yours back up here. Um, I find the exact same thing seems to have hap happened. Notice the first three days, they're getting almost nothing. They're three days into this seven day thing they're doing, and it's not getting any reach. A prophet had spent this much time and energy and nobody's watching the damn thing. You and I both know at day number three, they did the same thing we did. They started paying for a little bit of advertising and that's how they got the views that they got. Yes. Um, this next, uh, page or slide kind of shows, and this was another thing Anthony said is a huge indicator of paid advertising is when the engagement to or the, the engagement to views ratios are way off what is normal. So it's pretty normal for views to be the highest and then likes to be next and then comments to be even lower. So there's always going to be a disparity there, but not quite like this. And I do apologize. Some of the lettering I maybe could have made a bit bigger, um, but we've got 12 and a half million total views. All right. Um, and the number of likes was 29.1 thousand. So that's one like per 429 and a half views. And then for comments, it's obviously going to be worse, but it's a lot worse. It's only 1.49 thousand. So this is one comment per 8,389 views. It's an enormous difference. Um, and then I just want to show this is actually the Christmas message for this year. Just a, a quick clip here. This is being run as an ad, the uh, the light of Jesus Christ, a Christmas message from President Russell M. Nelson. And uh, at the time that this was taken, you see the, the letters in blue. Um, 275.8 thousand VPH is views per hour. This is how much the church is uh, uh, being able to generate. So this one's got 20 million views. So this one I, apparently is also extremely prophetic and is getting out there in front of a lot of people. Uh, but it is definitely being paid for. So I just wanted to point out how amazing and miraculous it is uh, when you're probably one of the richest corporations in the world to pay for advertising to get a video in front of people that it works and can be one of your most successful videos up to that time. I did just want to point out one more thing. Uh, I think this was in the clip uh, that I, I took off where Sherry, I think she says that uh, things that were really unusual about the uh, the Give Thanks campaign was that it was released on a Friday. She says that's the worst day to to do that. No experts would say to, to release on a Friday. And um, I'm just gonna share my screen here. It's a real quick Google. Um, and the question, maybe I'll uh, scroll up. I don't know if you can see it. Um, the question I wrote, or I, I just typed in was best day of the week to release YouTube video. And it seems like it's not fully showing that on the screen for whatever reason. But um, anyway, according to Boosted, the highest level in of engagement on YouTube occurs on Friday through Saturday and on Wednesdays. Um, 
So yeah, it's the best, it's one of the best days to do that. So I don't know what YouTube, uh, you know, experts uh, and PR people that she's talking about that would advise against that. She did also mention the length of the video, which I believe was 11 minutes, 37 seconds. And if I were to go back, I would say that's actually not too, she made it sound like it's really long. That's such a long video where, of course, we know that's, I, I think anyone on YouTube would know that's that's actually a really short video uh, compared to what's out there. Um, if you look at this one, this ad that they're running now, it's only three minutes and 43 seconds. I would say it maybe is a bit long for an advertisement. That is a hugely long advertisement, but it's still, you know, when you pay for what you, you know, what you can pay for, then you can still get the results that you want if you've got endless money to throw at something. And just by the way, when I look up what is the ideal length of time that a YouTube video should be, the experts are saying between seven to 15 minutes, which would be All 11. Right. I just feel bad for sure. I know she's trying really, really hard to make this a miracle, but it's just not on any front. Um, I don't know if we're going to get into the fact that it, this was her idea or if we feel like we covered that enough RFM. I don't know. We, we can oh, well, I think there. we will just a little bit, but this is great stuff that you found, Maven. I really appreciate it. Yeah, if we had the coffers that the LDS Church has and we could sprinkle our fertilizer in the form of money <laughs> in advertising our podcast, I imagine that we could reach a sizable number of people more than those who are interested in actually watching it. Oh, By I'm the sorry, way, did I say that or did I just think that? <laughs> By the way, it it seems as though what really happened, if I were to guess is that somebody who is their technology expert, whoever their person is that is expert, their expertise is to coordinate the YouTube uh, videos. The expert would have told them to release it on Friday and the expert would have told them to make it a little over 11 minutes long. Just- I, so You're I, saying he is a prophet. <laughs> somebody <laughs> is. He's a prophet who's got a bunch of dumbasses around him. Yeah. I, well, I think, well, maybe I think that's a good point. Cause as we've seen, Sherry brought up this idea first and now that became Nelson's, he was able to absorb it. So maybe it's the same when you have experts around you, um, you know, uh, Benson yeah. with his 14 fundamentals said like the, the prophets never need to consult ever, uh, you know, any real experts they are, already are. And maybe this is the mechanism. They just absorb the advice given to them and it is now coming fully from them. And maybe that's the magic that prophets have uh, that nobody else does so that, yeah, it's everything is, uh, it's, it's his idea and it's his expertise or his prophetic insight. Um, it, it's, it's all his, so it, there you go. It's prophetic as in uh, like ownership. <laughs> He's taking ownership of it. Yeah. Tell that to the surveys yeah. and pilot programs. Yeah. And I feel like what Cherry has done is given us an insider or back, back, uh, backstage view on what it is that constitutes a revelation. She called it a revelation. And yet she tells us that we went to him with this idea. And then that night he tweaks it a little bit. And by the following day, it's a freaking revelation. Now, interestingly, at or near the time that this two years ago, the Give Thanks 11 minute video was released, President Nelson also released a little uh, statement about the story behind how he came up with this idea of doing the Give Thanks program. And I just wanna say before you go into that, for the first three days that this video ran, it, it sucked ass. It, it didn't do very good. It, it didn't do anything until they paid for the advertising. Right. But, you know, he's an honest guy. And I'm sure that if he's going to give us the backstory on how he came up with this idea, he's going to talk about Sherry Dewey. He's going to talk about the group that came up to him with the original idea. And then how he, uh, that night, he had some kind of a, an awakening or an inspiration. And then he he got uh, the the tweaks that made it that made it work. So let's see let's see if he does that. Here it is, an unexpected awakening. And I've got to tell you, I can't read this right now. I would like Maven. Could you read this? Because I want you to read the part where he talks about Sherry Duke. <laughs> 
you want me to read the whole thing or just the part, the part where he talks about Sherry? <laughs> it won't take you long to talk about Sherry Duke because he doesn't mention her. In he fact, doesn't. this appears to be a full-blown revelation that comes to him in the middle of the night. There's no backstory on it. There's no Sherry Do. There's no people coming up with the idea. It's just God, God, and more God. But if you could read this, that'd I be great. At least to. the first paragraph and then build the second one. All this right. is President Nelson telling us how this idea came about. Have you ever had the experience of waking up in the middle of the night with a distinct thought or impression? Since beginning yes, and it's usually I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah. or kick I'm my sorry, go ahead. Bed. <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> Since beginning my ministry as the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I've had my share of unexpected awakenings. Many of these have proven to be special and sacred moments from God. I want to share one such experience related to the special video message that was released today, November 20th, 2020, which I'm sure also had nothing to do with the date uh, being chosen, November and, and 20th, just the, 2020. And just notice, too, that this guy sounds like the Cheeto cat. I, I, I Like there's all these eyes in there, right? There's not going to be any Sherry Do. A few weeks ago, I woke up in the middle of the night with a thought that I should offer a prayer of gratitude to God for all of his children around the globe. Hey, Thoughts Bill, flooded. Bill, Bill yeah. there is no I in Sherry do. No, there's <laughs> not. Thoughts flooded my mind of all the things for which we should be grateful and how expressing that gratitude could become a healing spirit in our lives. As the inspiration came, specific de details, including when and how I should share this message, came to my mind and heart. The video message shared today was not one that came by chance, and it is one that came from heaven. Uh, it did come by chance, the chance that Sherry Dew and her crew brought up the idea to him. Or maybe he's right, calling Sherry Dew heaven. That's actually really nice. That's sweet. It's very sweet. I just realized that Sherry actually does have an eye in it. Yeah. <laughs> <That's what> I, <laughs> <know>. <laughs> I not only stink at math, spelling is not my forte either, apparently. Yes, there is an eye in Sherry. Okay, I'm sorry. So yeah, is that everything that he said about credit. it? Was there anything more? He certainly takes the credit, but yeah, there's nothing in there. I, I looked it over earlier today. There's nothing in there about Sherry Do. Yeah, can I just, uh, Bill, can you read this? Let me read this part. I'm not going to go to in everything give thanks, but one of the greatest gifts of God. I mean, he can't lay it on thick enough about this tweaking he did to Sherry Do's idea. Since my service as president of the church in 2018, one of the things the Spirit has repeatedly impressed upon my mind is how willing the Lord is to reveal His mind and will. The marvelous privilege of receiving revelation is one of the greatest gifts of God to His children, available to every one of us, at least if we have Sherry Dew counseling us. No matter who you are, you can pray to your Heavenly Father for guidance. See, Bill, there's some use and direction in your life. If you learn to hear the Lord through His promptings, you may receive divine guidance in matters large and small. I am grateful for the awakenings I have received in my life that have helped me to know that the heavens really are open today. Our Savior Jesus Christ is the greatest example of both heeding the will of his Father and giving thanks in all things. So what has happened now is that Sherry Dew has inadvertently blown the lid open on this story that President Nelson told about how he received the revelation two years ago. And now she's giving the backstory, which lets us know it really wasn't quite as simple and clear cut and revelatory as President Nelson would have had us believe. Yeah, somebody's not telling the truth exactly, huh? I think Sherry Dew's getting closer to it. Yeah, me too. So let's see, is there anything else more to this story? Um, oh, yeah. The postscript to this story is we cannot forget the fact that President Nelson, in giving this suggestion, recommendation, edict is too strong a word, to the world to give thanks every day of the seven days leading up to Thanksgiving in 2020 is something that he himself did not do. I'm not sure he even tried. We did a show on this about two years ago, and none of the top 15 gave thanks for those seven days on social media. We tracked it. There were a couple who gave it a whack. And I think that Elder Gong was one who tried on a couple of days. And Elder Rasband might have made it for three before he petered out. But none of the top 15 followed this rather simple recommendation, this revelation from God to President Nelson. 
which shows you how seriously they took it. And the only thing that made it stand out even more in my mind, this, frankly, hypocrisy on their part, is the fact that I have a friend, is the guy who baptized me, and I was following his Facebook feed. He's still active. He did it every single day for seven days. And then he kept going even beyond that. So what we have is the leaders telling us this is revelation from God for us to do. And these are rules from God for thee, but not for me, because it wasn't important enough for them to even put on social media for seven measly days, things they're thankful for. Beautiful. And without the advertising dollars, most of the rest of us wouldn't have paid attention either. <laughs> True. <laughs> All right. Um, the next one, uh, Maven, there's a one with a timestamp of 929 to 1011. If you don't mind, we'll, uh, we'll play that one. Okay, one second. There's so many clips and they all have the yeah, same yeah, totally. <laughs> thumbnail. So I have to go by the, so this is about, um, you said 929 to 1011? 929 to 1011, okay. yeah. I've got that coming right infallible. up. Sherry, she said, some of my friends think prophets make mistakes, but I don't know what to believe. Do you think prophets are infallible? Some of you may have that same question. If infallible means perfect, then no. I don't think prophets are perfect. Only one perfect being walked this earth and he was God. Prophets are mortal and are being tested just as we are. Being ordained as special witnesses of Jesus Christ gives them unique spiritual privileges, but it does not magically absolve them of human weakness. Further, I've never heard a prophet claim perfection. Have you? So I'll just say here, every time we allow the church and its apologists to make the crux of the question fallibility, we are allowing them to do a bait and switch where they take the real issue and swap it out with a straw man that gives them cover and obfuscates the problem. The real problem is once we understand the degree to which leaders of this faith are not only fallible, but dishonest, deceptive, immoral, contradictory, and seemingly unable to discern the difference between God's word and false doctrine. What is the use in putting one's trust in them? How are they any more effective than any other random set of 15 old men? So now let's play the timestamp. Oop, let me change this up here. Um, oh, can I mention one thing there, Bill? Yeah. Because what she's going to do is she's going to say, no, they're not infallible, but everything that they say is perfect. It's from God, whether by my own voice or by the voice of my service, it is the same. And then she's going to actually say that she's going to dodge the question. And she says, I don't even think that this is that significant or relevant a question. Instead, I'm going to direct you to four other questions that I think are much more relevant and which will much more effectively lead to the points that I'm trying to make, which is you follow them whether you like it or not. Yeah. And she's doing the same trick that Midnight Mormons did with us having the conversation around people having spiritual experiences. She is creating a straw man that the critics of the church have this problem with prophets not being perfect people. And that's not the issue at all. And every time we allow apologists or allow uh, church leaders to change the question to it being about fallibility, then you're, we're allowing them to distract away and to do a bait and switch away from the, the real crux of the issue. And so Maven, if you'll play that timestamp of 11 minutes to 1147, where she sh sets up this idea of unanimity and then we'll go right into the next one of 1938 to 1952. The Lord governs his church through a very unique pattern of presencies, councils, and quorums so that no one person acts alone. President Nelson explained that, quote, the calling of 15 men to the Holy Apostleship provides great protection for us as members of the church. Why? Because decisions of these leaders must be unanimous. Can you imagine how the Spirit needs to move upon 15 men to bring about unanimity? Close quote. Brothers and sisters, the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, acting unitedly, will never send the church in the wrong direction. And here is why. Because even the prophet is not the head of this church. Jesus Christ is, and he is perfect. 
And if you'll play that next one from 1938 Because to this is the Lord's church, and Jesus Christ is the one who chooses and directs his prophets, the Savior will never let the prophet lead the church astray, period. So um, let me say this. So sanctioning murder, let me put, um, and I'm speaking here of Brigham Young, sanctioning murder doesn't, when he talked about the javelin through the heart, doesn't lead the church astray. Lying doesn't lead the church astray. For instance, the 1933 official statement on the 1886 revelation where we showed and Brian Hales agreed that they were lying. Obfuscating and hiding the damaging parts of one history and one's personal behavior that is unethical doesn't lead the church astray. Teaching false doctrine doesn't lead the church astray. Adam, God, and the race ban. Manipulating and coercing underage girls into intimate relationships doesn't lead the church astray. Joseph Smith on numerous occasions. Lying to your wife about other intimate relationships with women doesn't lead the church astray. Joseph Smith on multiple occasions. Plagiarizing other people's work to create pseudopigrapha and Bible revisions doesn't lead the church astray. Adam Clark's commentary. Being sexist, homophobic, or racist doesn't lead the church astray. You can pick your random church leader for that one. Changing doctrines all the time to the point where either the before or the after has to be false. Elder Bednar taking away free agency, for example. Teaching disavowed theories about the nature of God's identity, the nature of the Holy Spirit, uh, lectures on faith. Who can hold the priesthood and who can't, 1978 Revelation and before. Teaching falsely what causes homosexuality, Spencer W. Kimball. Teaching that people of color will be servants or slaves in heaven, I think that's Mark E. Peterson. Teaching that being gay was a choice, also Spencer W. Kimball, as well as the entire LDS church for a while. Teaching suicide was a sin. Bruce R. McConkie, again, what use are prophets if they can, by their own admission, as shown by the historical evidence, that they have been inconsistent on every single doctrine of the church and have on innumerable occasions been immoral, unethical, or deceptive? In other words, for any believer who's out there listening, what would these 15 men who insist that they are prophets, seers, and revelators have to do for you to either sense that they led the church astray or to sense that maybe they weren't even prophets in the first place. Once you, grab, once you grasp the collective disunity of their teaching over 200 years, combined with their deep struggle to be honest and forthright and eth ethical, there is nowhere left for one to hang your hat. The, in other words, there's this argument from the church that Prophets can't lead the church astray. She even uses that. She tells that story in this talk. We didn't play it, but she tells that story in this talk. The twinkle in his eye, he'll never lead the church astray. The Lord would remove him, blah, blah, blah. When the reality is that any possible thing that you would consider worthy of leading the church astray has actually happened in the 200-year history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and hence, there is no bad behavior there is no false teaching. There is no changing of doctrine that could ever justify at this point the church being led astray because it's all already been done and members still believe the church hasn't been led astray. Right. The answer from a faithful member's point of view is what the prophet has to do to lead the church astray is always X plus one. It's always something more than what they've done already. And if they were ever to do that something more, then that becomes the X, and it's still X plus one. Right. It, I say that for Logan Tatum, my mathematics friend from the East Coast. All, it is all roads lead to Rome, and the Rome is being the church is true. Yes, or in other words, all roads lead to Salt Lake City. You know, she says that uh, the leader of the church is actually Jesus. He's the perfect one, the only perfect one who ever lived. And, you know, you can tell that Jesus is perfect by what a bang-up job he's doing leading this church. Yeah. Um, the, everything's going well. There's no problems here. Nothing to see here. Continue on your way. Absolutely. Absolutely. So did you have any, maybe did you have anything you wanted to add there? I, I know you wanted to mention RFM, the Catholic church. You and I were talking about this this morning. Oh yes. Well, it's this whole idea about Catholicism, which is simply that uh, I know I've mentioned it before, but it bears repeating that when I joined this church, 
you know, we have the true gospel. We have a prophet on the face of the earth who gets revelation from God, just as Moses did for the children of Israel. And we would mercilessly mock the Catholic Church, at least privately among us missionaries at the MTC, for how they had no revelation. They don't even claim revelation. Instead, when they have a question they have to resolve, they don't go to God. They all get together and they have discussions and debates and then votes about what it is that the doctrine should be for the Catholic Church. And then once that vote is taken, everybody is required to get in line with the majority. And that becomes the doctrine of the church. Now, that was a lot funnier back when I was in the MTC than it is today when I start realizing that the church now, the LDS church, is admitting that that's exactly the, the manner and method they use to establish doctrine. They get together, they talk about it, they discuss it, they get uh, a consensus, and boom, that is now what constitutes revelation in the Lord's church. The Lord doesn't even really have to be involved anymore. Yeah. And, and when we were talking about this morning, I mean, you mentioned all three things and I was like, yep, all of these were things I was taught too. that you and I were taught that it was the bad behavior of the popes and other leaders within the Catholic church. Number one, that it was the councils and creeds. I think the most mentioned one was the Nicene creed, um, but that the councils and creeds, which decided the very nature of God through voting and the changing of the saving ordinances. And those three things were in the manuals and were taught to you and I on a regular basis as being the crux of the apostasy and why the Catholic Church lost its authority and why all the Protestant churches couldn't be true either because they were all dead branches from a dead tree. And today in Mormonism, the LDS Church does all three of those by the... Um, Hubie Brown, apostolic charge, we know that it is the unanimity, and by the way, Sherry Dew also testifies that that's true. The church has changed all of its doctrines. All you have to do is read Charlie Harrell's book, This Is My Doctrine, to understand that that's been the case. And then bad behavior by leadership, and all you have to do is uh, read Greg Prince, read uh, uh, D. Michael Quinn and their work, and you can see the ethics around, say, Leonard Arrington or David O. McKay, and I'm not saying David O. McKay did horrible things. I'm saying the book by Greg Prince about the David O. McKay and the rise of modern Mormonism, as well as uh, Greg Prince's books on Leonard Arrington and D. Michael Quinn's books on the early uh, origins of power of the church and Joseph Smith's treasure digging to recognize that there has been leadership through 200 years that have made uh, unethical choices and have uh, carried out uh, really uh, bad behavior. And we've done episodes covering some of that stuff as well. Yes, we have. Everything that we used to claim showed that the Catholic Church was in a state of apostasy are now things that we do ourselves. Yeah, so now, now we must be in apostasy because that was the standard by which we judged the Catholics in apostasy. Hence, this is also now a dead tree. Oh, contraire, my friend. We simply change the standard and move the goalposts. Yeah, and that's the that is the game plan uh, in every moment of church history when things don't go well. Or in other words, the ongoing restoration. <laughs> the covenant path. All right. That's what the ongoing restoration is. It's yeah. changing the standard and moving the goalposts. Every time I hear ongoing restoration, I know exactly what they're talking about. Yeah. You, me, and about uh, 520 people sitting here watching this. Uh, the next, are you done with this section? Yes, yes, thank you. The next section is um, a timestamp 1530 to 1554. Have you ever asked yourself what's in all of this for apostles? Clearly, it's not money or popularity or comfort. Well beyond retirement age, they board planes and fly around the world for one reason. They have none other object save it be the everlasting welfare of our souls. And yet, all too often, they are mocked for teaching truth. Well, I'm going to continue the mocking right here. So she just said, it's clearly not money, it's clearly not popularity, and it's clearly not comfort. But let's check this out. First off, we know that they are, uh, that they are paid well. 
Uh, they have a living stipend of last we checked about a decade ago, about 120,000. You can bet your ass that that's had uh, some price increases. Um, there are it's up over 200,000 with a regular cost of living allowance on yeah. an annual basis. Yep. We know that they get um, free health care. They get brand new cars. They are deeply popular within an echo chamber in the insulated circles that they isolate themselves within. We know they're comfortable. They each have multiple homes. They have a wide array of wealth. Two good examples of this are Thomas S. Monson and Boyd K. Packer, who when you read about their lives, they, they did not have wealthy employment. I don't remember. One of them worked with the church from an early age, which I think was President Monson, and I think President Packer worked with the Deseret News um, and you're a CES instructor too. And then CES instructor. And we both we both know those aren't super high paid positions. But somehow by the time the top 15 get towards the end of their life, they have multiple homes. They have a wide array of wealth. They have the best health insurance, new vehicles every few years. They fly first class, of course. They have the best of everything. And people love them wherever they go. But it's clearly not money, popularity, or comfort, all three of which they have plenty of in their stockings. Right. And when they board those planes, they're boarding first class. Yeah. And there's pictures of them riding first class. They, We don't ever get them sitting in scrunch seats on Frontier. No, you don't uh, sit by Mick Jagger if you're riding coach. Yeah, that's to you, Gene R. Cook. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, let me think here. There was something else that she had said there that was of interest about, oh, they have no other object than our everlasting welfare and the saving of our souls. Boy, that puts a chill right down my spine because there is no greater corrupting influence, more than money, more than popularity, more than comfort. The greatest corrupting influence in history is people who have our everlasting welfare in mind because Power. that covers a multitude of sins. It covers hiding things, not being honest, deceiving the members of the church. And this in spite of the fact that Sherry Dew actually looks at the camera and says at one point in her talk that these are the most honest men on the face of the earth. Yeah. And and she hits us again. This will be timestamp 1342 to 1432. Is there anyone you trust to give you more inspired advice unaffected by personal agenda yeah. than the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles? My answer. Can you think of any journalist, talk show host, celebrity, athlete, or politician you would trust more than our prophet? How about any entrepreneur, billionaire, or scholar? Any YouTube celeb or star of stage, screen, or Netflix? I can't. Each of these wants something from us. They want our vote, our money, our support. They all have personal agendas. Prophets of God do not. Their agenda is the Lord's. And yet too often we listen to them last. This is insider baseball. Um, and what I mean by that, let me, let me change the camera view here. What, what I mean by that is only when I was on the inside of Mormonism, and programmed to see those leaders as my authorities and to trust them to be the bearers of all truth and to have apprehension and skepticism towards any outside voice. And so when she tells people, who else would you trust with, with giving you advice? Would you trust the politicians? Would you trust the movie stars? Would you trust the YouTubers? She's asking the wrong thing. I mean, are there any scientists? Are there any psychologists that I would trust? I'll, I'll take Brene Brown, for instance. She says more in yep. one book that would help human beings be be better than these men have said in 25 years of general conference. Um, once People I People have already go, uh, nominated her, and I yeah. said I would sustain her uh, yeah. as prophetess. <laughs> once I Did let go... the comments from the people who are saying RFM? <laughs> ahead, no, will do. <laughs> okay, thank you. Once I let go of Mormonism and I started to listen to ideas being promulgated throughout the world, I started to feel really embarrassed that I had um, 
limited my exposure to really intelligent, articulate, informed voices in the outside world. And she's speaking inside her language to Mormons because the moment Mormons deconstruct their faith and step outside of it, they are all amazed and in awe of how much wisdom and good common sense exist outside of the church that we were so reluctant to even look at in fear that it would be, uh, we, we would be deceived by it or even just, we almost just kind of discounted it entirely and saw it as having no value. And in, I would simply note that Sherry Dew, again, is speaking to members of the church, but if any member of the church were to reach out to me and say, Bill, give me, give me 10 people who would have better things to say than the top leadership of the church, and I would, I would push back and want to write at least 100, and I think in a week I could probably come up with 1,000 people that I would trust their voices better they, I would see them as being more honest, and I would see them as, as the information which they share to be deeply more helpful uh, to living a better life and finding peace and contentment and being productive and kind to your neighbor. Yeah, give me a phone book. Yeah, you could just about point out a page and make a phone call, and you'd have somebody better. So that's all I've got for those three. Amen. 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 <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, you have just made my Christmas. Thank you very much. Merry Christmas. Your your presents are coming late, guys, because I still haven't put them in the mail. <laughs> but I have them. I'm so sorry. <laughs> anyway, okay, you can overnight it. It won't co cost a lot more. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can always do that. Okay, tangent. Anyway, back on track. Um, I did want to say this is. Uh, really kind of, I guess, if we're getting back to rhetoric that can be so harmful, it's just this idea, this dichotomy that only prophets care about you and nobody else can, they all have something to get out of it. And Bill, you, you were saying this, it's just really sets up this idea that nobody else out there ever cares about truth. Nobody out there is learning anything for truth's sake and like experts, like every expert has an agenda and it's just so sad and, and scholars even, yes, they can, but many really do want to know what the evidence shows and want to follow that. And this was kind of how I was raised almost like with this idea that like scientists are just waking up in the morning and putting on their lab coats and like, what are we like, what can we do today to disprove God? That, that was kind of a narrative that was often Fed to me as a kid that I really believed, of course, except for when science happens to boost up something that a prophet or an apostle is saying, then then it's cool and it's kosher. But yeah, it's just this constant narrative is like the whole world is against you. They're all trying to deceive you. They're all trying to get something from you, but not me. I just, I hate it. Yeah, yeah, totally. All right. Um, that's the three that I've got. I know you've got another one here you want to go into about the prophets having no agenda or no, sorry, the dueling models. Oh, right. Thank you very much. If you actually pay attention to what Sherry Dew says, um, at least what happened to me was I began noticing that she has internally inconsistent and contradictory messaging just within this one talk. One of them has to do with prophets are not popular, right? They're not in this for the popularity. She said that in the clip you played. If you get to the end of this talk, and it's not that long a talk. It's amazing how many contradictions she packs into a relatively brief address. But she will tell three stories about how popular the prophet is. She'll talk about saints in the Philippines waiting around eight hours, I think it was, for the president of the church to show up. Then she talks about, it was in Tonga, I think, where the saints there waited for hours in the rain. It was practically a monsoon for President Nelson to show up. And then she talks about some in, I think it was Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. Obviously not the same numbers because we haven't been there very long, but that they're showing up for it. So on the one hand, she talks about they're not in it for the popularity. On the other hand, she talks about all the popularity that they receive. Um, greater, I would think, the most rock stars waiting for by the thousands in rain for hours for them to make their appearance on stage. So there's the one thing. Second thing that struck me 
was how she uses different models for revelation. Now, I have talked before about the fact that there have been three primary models for revelation in the church that have gone chronologically, starting off with the prophet is the guy who receives the revelation from God and tells the people, i.e. Joseph Smith. Then around the turn of the 20th century, we backed off of that as a church. And we started talking not about the president acting alone, but the president acting with his counselors, i.e. the first presidency. And it was the first presidency that had the power to establish doctrine. And they did that by means of first presidency statements. So we went from the president now to the first presidency. And now in much more recent years, we have the idea that all top 15 have to agree in order for it to be doctrine. Well, what Sherry Dew does is she comes up with all three. She gives examples of all three. We had the quote from President Nelson that she presented. All 15 have to agree. Imagine how the spirit has to move on 15 men in order to get them all to agree. Okay, that's totally a non sequitur because really all that God needs to do is show up and tell the president what he wants to do. Why is there all this stuff about the spirit moving on 15 men to get agreement? This is a sideshow. Agreement is an excuse for the absence of revelation. Actually, that ended up being pretty good. I think it was inspired to say that. Let me try it again. Agreement is an excuse for the absence of revelation. It's not revelation itself. But in the absence of revelation, they have to come up with something. So now it's going to be agreement. That's what it is today. So there's the first example. She tells a story about President Nelson waking in the middle of the night, coming up with this idea for this Give Thanks uh, video. It was the very next day, remember, that he calls him and says, you have the right idea, but we need to tweak it a little bit to make it revelation. He didn't talk to his counselors. Not that she says. He doesn't seem to have had enough time. He certainly didn't talk to all the, the 12 apostles about this idea. No, this is the example in the model of the president receiving revelation directly from God and acting on it. So she's got that one. At the end of her address, she gives a story where she says she and her boss approached the first presidency about a complex issue related to media. And then the three in the first presidency have different ideas and they talk about it. And then they come to an agreement and make a decision in front of her. And she walks out the door and says, oh, my gosh, I just saw revelation happening. You know, it's like the other night upon the stair, I saw a man who wasn't there. Well, she sees these guys talking and coming to an agreement. And now she's going to say that's revelation. So within the context of this 120 some odd minute talk, she gives all three models for receiving revelation, which don't go together. They don't go together. If you start off with the idea that all 15 have to agree. Why are you giving examples of the first presidency receiving revelation themselves, much less the president of the church receiving revelation alone? So that's a contradiction within her talk. And the last one that I noticed that I want to bring up is how she talks about that Give Thanks video and how it went viral. And so many people saw it. More people heard a prophet's voice with this video than ever had in the history of the world, I think is what she said. And what she's saying there is that the popularity of this message shows it was inspired, shows it was revelation, and proves that President Nelson is indeed a prophet. It's the popularity of the message that proves it. But then she'll turn right around on a dime and in the same talk say, prophets are not popular. And in fact, if they were popular, you would know something was wrong. So don't lose your testimony just because they're getting shredded on social media because they're not supposed to be popular. So if a prophet, if his message is popular, it shows he's a prophet. If a message from a prophet or a person is not popular, it shows they're a prophet. That's the problem is when you've got a criteria that shows you're a prophet. And the exact opposite of that same criteria shows that you're a prophet. Then what we can conclude from that is that that criteria is not incredibly effective at deter determining who is a prophet. Yeah. Yeah. It, 
And, and you find this works all the time, right? Like in almost every issue in Mormonism, there are apologetics playing both sides of the aisle. Uh, so that no matter which way you come down, whether you believe it was a long scroll or whether you believe it was a catalyst theory, either way, it's still a true translation. And and that kind of game gets played all throughout Mormonism because nobody really wants to go, look, let's let's create an actual litmus test that you could fail. Because like I asked earlier, the question becomes, what could these men do that would indicate the church isn't true? Like, uh, let me frame it differently. To any believer out there, could you describe to me what the church could would look like if it weren't true? If it weren't true, how would it look different than how it looks today? If the church's leaders are not prophet seers and revelators, how would that look? And the reality is you couldn't come up with anything different than the way it currently looks now. Yes, the way I've heard that put is uh, if the church were not led by revelation, how would it look? Just like this. Kind of like the way it looks. All right, we're to this wonderful story now that um, I think it's the last story we're going to be covering in tonight's episode that Sherry Dew tells. And if we play that clip, I had reached out to Maven because I really thought that this might resonate with her, especially. I know I found it problematic. I think she does too. But this is a really, really interesting story that she tells. And the, the moral that we're supposed to take from it, I think, is obvious. Maven, did you want to introduce this? Um, yes. And funnily enough, now I'm, I'm having a hard time finding the video clip, um, which I thought I did. Um, so let me, sorry, let me see if I've got it here. Okay. Um, oh, no, here it is. I just named it something different. Okay. So this, if people watch this, I, um, I just had a really unsettled, there's a lot of things that were kind of just unsettling in general, just like the, the fertilizer uh, comments on the idea just it seemed to kind of come off to me. But this is, I think, one of the heartbreaking parts of the story that just goes to show how much women's feelings don't matter and, and how much they can just really get steamrolled over. And if you are hurt as a woman in the church, you're not allowed to or you're not supposed to ever address it. So Sherry's going to tell a story about something an apostle did. And I don't know, but I just, I just feel like it's Bednar. I just, I came to that conclusion, but I really don't know who it was. Um, but anyway, a, of an apostle that made her cry and we'll see why. And I think a lot of women uh, will completely understand this. So I am going to go ahead and get this one pulled up and here we go. While serving in the Relief Society General Presidency, I attended a general authority training session held prior to general conference. During that meeting, the apostle conducting the training did something unusual. Whenever someone used the words woman or man, he corrected them and told them to use the words mother or father instead. At first, I didn't think much about it, but as the meeting wore on for several hours, and this apostle repeatedly emphasized that women were mothers and men were fathers, I started to shrink in my chair. I became painfully aware that I was the only non-parent in the room. By the end of the morning, frankly, I felt condemned. When the training ended, I bolted out of the room so no one would see my tears. At first, I was just hurt, but then I began to seethe. How could an apostle disenfranchise an entire segment of members? I'm sorry to tell you that I stewed about this for months until I began to work on my upcoming talk for the General Relief Society meeting. I pleaded for inspiration about what to speak about, but I got nothing. I had no ideas. Then finally, I received a clear impression that I should speak about motherhood. Oh, I thought, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> but the impression was very, really clear. So I began to search the scriptures and teachings of prophets. I went to the temple again and again, and I pleaded for understanding. And guess what I learned? That the apostle who had offended me was right. His approach might have been insensitive, but he had taught an eternal truth that every woman has a divine endowment as a mother, 
regardless of whether or not she's born children in this life. That truth led me to prepare an address entitled, Are We Not All Mothers? Which is still quoted every Mother's Day because it is filled with truth, truth that I had to humble myself to learn. Learn from my experience. Don't make life harder by being stupid. Yeah, um, so I, I just have a couple thoughts. Um, it's, first of all, I wanna point out the obvious that it's not helpful um, for single and infertile women. I think she is not the only one. I have many friends who had they been in that same situation would also have just had their hearts ripped out every time that happened, every time that correction was specifically pointed out hour by hour. And I'm, I'm really not talking about just low level offense here. I, I mean, devastated women who want nothing more. And so saying, you know what, you're kind of a mother anyway, doesn't help. It doesn't help. It doesn't change the reality of the situation. And it hurts. It hurts more. I mean, it hurts Sherry. She left quickly so no one would see her crying. But you know what? Her feelings don't matter because our feelings don't matter uh, as women. And, you know, besides all of the mothers like who who want that title but can't for whatever reason, there are many who do not deserve the title at all, not just mothers, but mothers and fathers. And I would say the parents of the poor girl from the AP article who was abused day in and day out for seven years, I don't think her parents deserve that title at all. It's a distinction that's far too above them and they, they just couldn't even do the bare minimum to do so it just you know they but they are literal mothers and fathers just not in the truest sense of that word so really it just it's just an awful thing to do and they're just an awful way to characterize everyone and so and she says she, it's quoted every mother's day because it's true no it's quoted every mother's day because this is still a huge problem in the church because it affects a huge amount of people in the church and it hurts and this is the best thing that people have to hold on to to try to make it feel better but it doesn't actually make anything better at all but it's all we've got and that's why it will be talked about every single Mother's Day because there's just a dearth of actually helpful information and actually helpful talks um, for women who are single and childless, or I, sh I should say families, because it, it also includes, I do want to include the men in that. So I wanted to play this, uh, what I, this reminded me of uh, a clip that I think Jonathan Streeter actually has also on on his site on thoughts and things and stuff. And so LDS Discussions did a TikTok with just some selected clips clips from it, and then Alicia Lee did kind of a reaction to it. So if you're just listening, you're missing all of her facial expressions, but she's just kind of acting along uh, with the uh, the clips and the suggestions being provided. So. Um, but the uh, the sound is what's most important. So I will get that queued up here real quick. Just to know yeah. just what you're saying, which is even if the church is true and there is a heaven on the other side and those who are childless in this life will have the opportunity to raise children there, it is still spiritual abuse to insist that in this mortality that people who are childless refer to each other as mothers and fathers. And not everybody even wants to be. So it's just, there's people who want to be that can't. There's people who don't want to be. There's people who are but shouldn't be. It's just it's just not helpful. But yeah. oh, go ahead, Arthur. You have that clip? I was just going to say that uh, we don't have to speculate or guess as to how this impacted Sherry Duke because she's telling us how it impacted her. She was in tears by the end of this meeting and she seethed about it for six months. It goes from general conference to general conference. It's six months that she's seething. And the one thing that I do note is that at no point do I hear Sherry Dew saying that she approached this apostle and told him how what he said made her feel. And I think the reason we didn't hear that from her is because that never happened. 
because the tacit understanding is she's a woman. She has no voice. She has no ability to talk to this apostle and tell him how she really feels. If how she really feels is saying that he said something that was wrong and insensitive and hurtful. Right. And so she's actually at the beginning of this clip. I want to set it up just a little bit more. It is a panel of women. Sherry Dew is one of them. I think Bonnie Corden is there. And I, um, uh, I've i lost the name of the other woman, which I'm sure the chat will have my back on uh, when we come back. So uh, Sherry Dew starts out reading a question from another member of the church, a woman. And this question, I think also just Every woman of the church understands and relates to this question. I'll bet you, 90, 99% of us. So here's the clip. It talks about how important women are in the church, but honestly, that has not been my experience. What suggestions do you have about working more effectively and in greater unity with priesthood leaders, especially when, from time to time, some leaders can seem a little dismissive. I've had some experiences with somewhat dismissive priesthood leaders. If I prayed for him, if I worked to understand him and better ways to express myself or approach him, praying for him by name, seeking to understand why he was the way he was, learning to love him. You know, charity never faileth. We as women tend to be sometimes, can we be shrill or demanding or stubborn? We have the best idea ever. And if they don't see it our way, clearly there's a problem. Here. So all I want to say is, sisters, when we ask that question, is it I? That's a really good place to start. If we're having a challenge with a leader in the church, we do not criticize. Ever, ever, ever. We do not criticize. Ever, ever, ever. And that's why. That's why the conversation... It's wrong to criticize leaders of the church, even if the criticism is true. And especially if yeah. you're a woman, apparently. By the way, right. I think that was Joy Jones. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, that's why we know that conversation, RFM, that you brought up never happened. Uh, because if she did, uh, she would. that would be Sherry being a shrill, demanding woman with this great idea of, hey, let's not talk about everybody as mothers and fathers. And you know what? Just, you know, counseling the brethren who obviously was really, really into whatever he was doing that day and the power trip that he had that day. And I just wanted to say, just uh, just my last couple of thoughts on this. Um, I really, I used to look up to Sherry a lot as, as someone who had been in the General Relief Society presidency as a single woman, especially the older I got as a, a single woman in the church and not just being single, but a career woman. And she seemed to have, you know, like she's rubbing shoulders with these higher ups. So she really seemed to kind of present a hope that, you could be, I guess, a legitimate person in the eyes of the church as a single woman at some point. But uh, I think this uh, this clip and, and many of the things that Sherry has done really show the price of that. Yes, she's been able to have a lot of privilege. Yes, she's single. Yes, she's a career woman. Um, yes, she doesn't have any children and all of that stuff. But she is towing the company line. So her talk as a single woman on Aren't We All Mothers, she is making it very clear where her loyalty is. And so even though in these, she doesn't meet all of the check boxes for what a woman should be doing, she is doing the number one most important thing any woman can do. You don't need a husband and you don't need kids, but that is to listen to the priesthood brethren above you. And as long as you repeat their words, then you are golden. And and that's just kind of how all women's roles are in the church. The church likes to brag that the Relief Society is the greatest, the biggest organization of women in the world, but it is not women led. Every single level reports to a committee of men. They pick that woman. Um, if they don't pick her counselors, they at the very, very least approve of those counselors. So there is no up and down among the women uh, in the leadership as far as levels and as, as far as reporting. It all ends up going back to males. So that's you know, and and all of these women in this panel, we're all doing the same thing. Yes, yes, we we agree. We women, we're shrill. It's our fault. If there's ever anything wrong with the leader, ask, is it me first? Because you are the problem. It's not a question, really. You are the problem. So you got to fix it. That's how I, 
that's how women are in the church and and we put know it lip, that's our role. Put a, put a little lipstick on and don't talk too much. Yep. And remember, loyal obedience to the leaders is the number one qualification when there's an opening at Deseret Book Industries or right. Deseret Book mm. at the top. And Bill, you were talking about this way up at the top of the show, actually. So this might be actually kind of a good sandwich. It's just in a patriarchal system. This is how women get along. So the majority of the women are suffering, including Sherry Dew. Obviously, she was even made to cry. But the way to get ahead is to support the patriarchy, rub shoulders there, and then you get granted some extra privileges. You all said that at, yeah, at the top of the show. And, and she is showing us exactly how she did that. So it, yeah. it's kind of sad. She she was a hero to me, but I, I see the cost of that now. It's again, it's um, I want to be careful here because women are the less privileged in a patriarchy. But th among the women, the women who enjoy the most privilege are the women who lift up the patriarchy. So, again, if you're in the hierarchy and you want to reduce the amount of trauma you have and you're already in the group, the bottom half group. Then you're going. Then the some women are willing and do because it's what we're taught to do as Mormons, good Mormons, is we lift up the patriarchy and then we end up with a little more privilege than those who don't. Yep. Or who can't? You're talking about her. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just say, or who can't fit in. Um, there's yeah. some women that just aren't going to ever be able to do all, all the right yeah. things. They they're either like me, single and unmarried and without children, or maybe because of you know lesbian uh, transgender uh, right or maybe being assaulted earlier in life uh they are not pure virgins you know and so they are not pure that way and so um the top women the good women get to be good women because there are bad women you know that that dichotomy there's mothers and then there's whores and you're yeah. you're one or the other it's always a dichotomy yeah, I was just going to say that um, I don't know if any of you remember the short-lived TV show back from the 1990s, American Gothic. But there was a character in there called uh, Sheriff Lucas Buck, who may or may not have been Satan incarnate. It's never quite answered, but it's a, a tantalizing prospect. Anyway, he gave this counsel to his sheriff in one uh, deputy, his sheriff's deputy in one episode. That sounds a lot like the job description that you were talking about, Maven. Here's what he says. All guilt is relative. Loyalty counts. And never let your conscience be your guide. <laughs> Winning formula um, in the Mormon church. Are we are we good for calls now? I know the ticker's been up for a bit. Are we ready? You guys all squared away on uh, or you want to you want to you want to go another 45 minutes off for them or, you know. No, no, I'm good. I'm good. All Thank right. you very much. All right, great. I what time is it? Too close. Well, it's 8.05. I didn't want to get too close to, close to 9. Okay, you still got 55 minutes? Yeah, yeah. We'll take a few phone calls. We do have one on the I'm screen. 662-667-6667. Uh, uh, is the number, or you can call 662-MORMONS. Uh, uh, type that out on your phone, and that'll get you in. We do have one caller. Uh, it looks like it is Nicola. Nicola, you are on Mormonism Live. How are you? I'm doing really good. Um, um, basically, I'm fine. Basically, my thing is, on my mission, I would have gone to prison if I had listened to my mission president because I got a subpoena thing to go to court in a court thing, and my mission president wanted me to go... He didn't want me to go, but I had to kick a flipping real. I really had to pick, kick up a total scene to make him t turn around and uh, listen to me. Yeah. Your mission Nicola, president there seems you to be some. Yeah, I'm sorry. There seems to be some noise in the background the there. Case. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get this sorted. I don't know. I don't. Is that better? Nicola, you're saying that your mission president wanted you to disobey the laws of the land in order to yes. uh, fulfill his yes, exactly. request not to not to show up at court, but you had been subpoenaed. And it was all the priesthood holders' fault in the first place because I got called to basically somebody admitted to me that they had done 
that basically someone admitted to me that they'd broken the law and they'd robbed a bank and they wanted to go to confess. Oh, so you're a so witness, not just a juror. To to... What? So you're a witness. No, the thing what this is, this is, I wasn't a juror, but I could have got called as a, as a witness because what happened was the bishop, the bishop turned around and said that he, um, he said he wouldn't tell him till Monday morning. He t- said he, that he got till Monday morning to go turn himself in. Then a new bishop went and took over the, the situation, and he basically uh, then went and reported it to the police on Sunday. So they came round and invest- um, arrested the guy. And uh, I had I got subpoenaed to court to testify that this guy was going to turn himself in because uh, my priesthood le- leaders were were a jerk and they didn't like if you're going to tell somebody they've got to go and turn themselves in now you've told it and you give them till Monday morning at nine o'clock um, to do it and you say if you haven't told by that I'm going to ring the police up and tell them you you're going to do that. Then if you, the other, the mission, the next uh, person decides that he's not going to do that, he should go around and see that person and tell that person that he can't live with those consequences of that situation. But, but basically, there's a new bishop. The bishop went and did it. The police came round to arrest him uh, because he just couldn't keep his flipping mouth shut till nine o'clock in the morning, which meant that left me and my companion to pack all his stuff up and everything. And like... I was really involved in this because this flipping guy really liked me on my mission. And uh, basically, I had told the mission president that he liked me. And I said to him, look, I need you to get me out of it here. And he wouldn't get me out of here. He, he wouldn't get me out of the area. He decided he's going to keep me there. And then the guy asked me to marry him. And uh, I said, well, um, basically, I can't do anything now. I'm on my mission. And then the guy confesses to me, and it just blows the whole thing. It got blown up, and it was a a really big... I I just had a quick comment on that, and I just think it's interesting that... Thanks, Nicola. Uh, yeah, thanks, Nicola, for calling in with that story. I, it reminds me of the whole AP article thing where they they want to have the bishops have privilege, right? The penitent privilege. But when it's with the sister missionary, like women in the church have no priesthood. We have no authority. We don't have any of that kind of like, penitent privilege with confessions or anything at all anywhere. But I bet you they were wanting her to have it as a missionary, uh, this, uh, you know, a client a penitent privilege and and not be a witness for something i just i could just totally see the church having or wanting it both ways there yeah yeah and we do hear of abuses happening you know again we've talked about it being a patriarchy we we certainly have gone into there being abuses <laughs> sorry rfm we'll uh let's try that um there are abuses within here. patriarchy and that being just one example of what nicola ran into Oh, yes, right. absolutely. I wasn't trying to be rude about the background noise. I was just hoping Nicola would tell Nemo and Peter Bleakley to tone it down a bit. Yeah, yeah there you go. Our next call is Byron, uh, I believe. So, Byron, you are on Mormonism Live. Are you there? Yes, am I on? Yeah, you are, my friend. You're live with RFM, Maven, and Boreal. <laughs> thousands and thousands of people are listening to you, Byron. No pressure. <laughs> Well, I wanted I wanted to thank you both, um, especially you RFM. Uh, I, I know that there's a little bit of a um, a character or a persona, uh, and I hope that you're able to accept my appreciation personally. Um, I can, and this is me, baby. This is all me, made. no persona. <laughs> well, I guess I just to be brief, I wanted to say that I think. Sherry Dew's title for her talk kind of encapsulates my issue. Sometimes we get down into the into the weeds about whether prophets are infallible, whether they're perfect. I think for me, the point is, are they even prophets? Um, I, 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 in a way, I wouldn't really have a problem with prophets that acted um, poorly in one way or another if they could actually prophesy. But when when the, the bar for prophecy is swapping cell phones 
you know, a few months before the pandemic. I, I think it's, I think it's so low. It was essentially sat on the ground. Anyway, love your show. Both of you, um, happy to hear your thoughts offline. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Byron, thanks so much for calling in and expressing your feelings toward me. <laughs> this is what RFM, you and I had talked about, but we didn't get to, um, was the cell phone thing. And I just, my only comment from that was just how funny it was that along with this caller, not just switching out cell phones, but just it catching up to technology that everybody else already has. That's what's thinking ahead in prophetic uh, times. Right. Could you just elaborate that a little bit more, Maven, because that's such a good point. Just the fact that everybody already had smartphones. And so I know when I was a missionary, like people already were having smartphone then, but like, but I had this little flip phone uh, and it was just so, yeah, it just was obviously so behind the times in our area book, it was all paper, everything was all paper. And I remember thinking, ah, oh, man, this would make so much more sense if, especially like an area book, people move around, you know, these things should be digital and then they could be like, you know, sent from, you know, into or follow an address and just automatically be sent to new missionaries. Like if someone moves out of the area or something. Um, so I remember even as a missionary, and this was in 2008, 2009. So this is before, like several years before, just that they, I, I, it could be so much better, but I thought that, you know, I'm trusting my leaders. There's gotta be a purpose to kind of going down in technology. It's for my own spirituality probably, and for my own good to not have this ease of technology. And and that's what I thought was a uh, special or part of what was so special about the mission till it flips. And now, now technology is okay. And that's not like an essential experience about it. And then I don't know if you wanted me to share about the iPad or the laptop, not laptop. I, they started off with iPads, but uh, if you listen to Rami Umtum Ruminations, who interviewed a member of the Correlation Committee, they I think it's his second episode with uh, this person. His name is Brian Harris. I want to say Rami Umtum Ruminations 57. Uh, they go into this extensively getting, they start off with Apple products, but the church has no control over it. Uh, so then they switch over to Android. And then, I don't know, did you want me to elaborate on that or is this too much, RFM? <laughs> oh, just that the whole goal is to make sure, to do their best, to make sure that these smartphones are as dumb as they possibly can be mm. and cannot be used to access information that is, you know, right. beyond what they're supposed to get, beyond the correlated materials. There's a whole world of information the church doesn't want missionaries accessing. So while they want to have the benefits of the communication, they, and perhaps playing the videos, like you mentioned, you play church videos on them. That's great. That's much better than the, the slideshows, the slide reels that we used to do back in Japan <laughs> with the little cassette tapes and the boop, boop. Or DVDs, if someone didn't have a DVD player. You're out of luck. Yeah. Exactly. So this is all good stuff, but there's a world of bad stuff out there that the church doesn't want the missionaries to be able to access. And so they have gone through how many years, uh, at least seven years, since the prototype and the pilot program of trying to work this out. And even so, even so, while these um, somewhat elderly gentlemen in Salt Lake City are trying to figure this out, they don't seem to realize that if you have a problem in understanding how to use an electronic device, the first thing you do is ask a teenager. Now your story, because I really want to hear this one. You want it? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, About your, okay. so should we my... say who this is? Yeah, uh, I'll go ahead and say it. my youngest brother is 10 years younger than I am, right? So, so he's 25? Uh, uh, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Enough. Was that? <laughs> That's close enough, yeah. Insensitive. <laughs> I'm sorry. Because it has to do with his mission is all I'm saying. Yeah. When he was on his so, mission, it would have been about seven, six years ago. Yeah, he's, he's on his mission and they've got... Um, They've got tablets and they're password protected by a pin, a six digit pin, uh, which which nobody knows uh, or nobody knew or was supposed to do, except I think maybe like APs or something. But uh, Can you stop for just a, a second, Maven? Yeah. Just so I'm understanding it. So in other words, there is a six digit pin that is top secret because if you don't know the, the pin number, then you can't access anything beyond what it is you're supposed to access as Correct. a missionary. Yes, that's my understanding is that if you're trying to, if you ever try to go anywhere off of what is already preloaded on, um, then this pin would come up. And if you entered the pin, then that, that was basically the admin code. Uh, and so that 
effectively blocked a lot of missionaries from being able, you know, once that pin came up, you know, you, you were done. Uh, so yeah, so no, this was a zone conference. My uh, brother was listening to his mission president and he said, uh, he, it was, it happened to be his anniversary. So he said, you know, such and such many years ago today, you know, my wife and I were sealed in the such and such temple or whatever. And my brother's a smart cookie. So he sat there and he's just started thinking like, huh. So he did a little math in his head, uh, figured out the year that that was, and then typed in the uh, wedding date, and that was it. <laughs> he had cracked it, so he figured it that out. Was a six di- that was a six-digit PIN number? Yep, yep, it was the mission president's wedding <laughs> anniversary date. And so, because he had said that in uh, yeah in a zone conference, my, my brother did the math, he did the math, and he figured it out. Um, and not just that, but I do just want to make a quick call out. This is to a Mormon Stories episode with uh, that was done with a missionary who they had like drives at, or drop boxes set up where they're sharing the CES letter documents back and forth and other episodes. I think they had some of yours. Um, I, it was just kind of a mix. Um, I think they also had letter for my wife, et cetera. Uh, All these things, just contraband, the digital contraband was able to be pretty easily passed around. And so there's a whole episode about that. And that I just thought was wild when I watched that one. So it's kind of funny. And then if I go back to Ramiumdum Ruminations, I do want to recommend that episode because it also goes into some pretty interesting analytics regarding porn usage. Uh, with devices that include cell phones and the tablets. So interesting stuff. It's worth a check out. Did, That's your all brother, I have to say. did your brother keep that pin number to himself? No, he shared it. <laughs> he had, he's had a of few months. <laughs> What's the yeah. point of being clever if you can't prove it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, eventually it got changed to something else. <laughs> but yeah, anyway. That's it. Did yeah, we probably. have any more calls? That's all I have to say on that. Were there any more calls, Bill? Yeah, we've got one more caller. Last caller of the night. This is uh, Janice, oh. I believe. Sorry, did Janice. RFM you have? Go ahead, go ahead, RFM, please. I'll hold on. No, one it's moment, just this comment that I had thought of when I was talking with Maven on the phone either yesterday or this morning about this whole idea that these miracle stories are so weak because they inhabit exclusively the realm of coincidence. Now, it's possible for a coincidence to be a miracle, I suppose, but a miracle is something that should be be so great that it can't be also a coincidence, at least to my mind, at least if it's going to be persuasive and convincing. But these are the best stories that Sherry Dew has. I presume if she had better ones, she'd be sharing them. But they're all coincidental in nature and sometimes quite a stretch to even make it a coincidence. And so the image came to my mind since I live up here in the Pacific Northwest where Bigfoot hides out behind the trees, right? Because he's the world's greatest hide and seek artist. You've heard that one, haven't you, Bill? He's he's really good at it. He's very good because it's very hard to find the guy. But it came to my mind is that God, or at least in, in the LDS theology, God hides behind the trees in the forests of coincidence. Mm. That's my attempt to be profound for this evening, a little Bigfoot yeah. analogy. Yeah, um, you ought to go where the evidence goes, and the evidence isn't very strong that Bigfoot is roaming out there. It is all tangential and circumstantial, and there's no solid evidence, but there's you know hundreds of people who you know go chasing him around the country, and we all have technology to record him, and Essentially, other than a video of him, you know, 80 feet away or a still picture of what looks like maybe somebody in a costume, we don't get to see Bigfoot very often. No, Carrie Peterson, God is not Bigfoot. Kane is Bigfoot. That's right. Thank you very much. (laughs) All right. Uh, Janice, you're our last call for the night. You're on the air. You're on Mormonism Live. What's on your mind? Hi. um, Well, thank you for your work. I didn't think that I'll be ever uh, ex-Mormon in in my lifetime. I was a member for 40 years and worked for BYU Brigham Young University, Hawaii. But then I was involved with the lawsuit with the uh, the Togo, one of the Togo Apostle, uh, Richard C. Scott. And so I we, I was defending with him, and I met him through the deposition. All that this was absolutely the case. Uh, 
didn't stand at all. But then church settled uh, because the, 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 the lawsuit was filed in Wyoming by two lawyers who happened to be the state, state president. Even now, made a lot of money through this uh, lawsuit. And uh, I became a victim. Uh, I lost about $2 million. And these two lawyers from Wyoming uh, sued the church for uh, $3 million. And they came to me and suggested that I uh, they can divide by half and half. Um, if they knew that they would win the case, uh, that uh, they'll give me 1.5. And of course, I was that righteous. And I said, absolutely not. I didn't think that they would actually file a lawsuit. And they did. So uh, I went through all the deposition. I had all the church lawyers defending me from my headquarters. And Dennis, uh, so anyway, Dennis, the, the lawsuit. Dennis, so, can I break in for just a second? Because you've, yes. you've absolutely captivated me at this point. So I can understand better what you're saying. Can you tell me what was the allegation in the lawsuit against Elder Scott, I think you said, and what was your involvement? Why were you involved in this lawsuit? So I was actually the officially working on the church project. I invested it money and gave over uh, close to $400,000 to Brigham Young University, Hawaii. I was consultant to the case. They appointed me to the project uh, director for Korea reason. So I actually uh, went to Korea, thought I would make a lot of money uh, for the church. And uh, Elder uh, Richard uh, Scott was the chairman of the education uh, from the uh, Top Apostle. So he was direct boss of the BYU, uh, even Hawaii. And so we were project? doing some Asia project for, uh, it, it, it was technology or city language learning. Uh, that uh, the missionaries were using this call GALL program for the learning foreign language, and they sort of turned around to uh, have learn learning as a make it a software learning uh, 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 English. And so then we had a Chinese representative. I was Korean representative, and and we put up the money and and thought that would be great for the church. So anyway, I uh, was representing with the, you know, uh, official business card, uh, BRE president support and all of that. I had a obviously, totally, obviously legitimate. And, but at the same time, these two lawyers from Wyoming saw an opportunity because they had a back door to one of their friends, uh, BYU got a small permission, permission paper to use my program. Anyway, so they claimed that my program, my uh, right, was not exclusive. That's why they sued the BYU Hawaii first. And the BYU Hawaii said, hey, we are non-profit. We got no money for $3 million. And they ran ahead and sued the church. So that's how they came to me and saying, hey, Dennis, you will be a victim, and I will reward you 1.5 uh, if I agree with them. And I was full of self-righteousness. I said, I didn't think they would even sue the church. So I said, absolutely not. And guess what? They actually did sue the church. So they, he, they named uh, Richard uh, G. Scott and my name together as, <laughs> as a defendant. So then whole church lawyers, uh, I, you know, McCombe and, and all the law firm and the church lawyers started defending me and Richard Scott. And uh, having... Uh, went through the final Wyoming uh, court. I was a key witness, and I had all the church lawyers representing me. And then somehow they could not bring uh, Richard Scott to Wyoming because it was it would it, because there was a big case. So there would be obviously hoopla, you know, LDS against LDS, and uh, before my uh, witness statement, they settled. They gave away three million dollars. And I was so shocked. So the, my church lawyers came to me uh, saying, hey, this was settled to sit They're so sorry. And uh, so just, uh, just like, hey, forget about it. You know, that kind of thing. I, next day, I went to Utah church headquarters. I met with Elder Bob who was in charge of intellectual property. 
he's in charge of this program. He was in charge of all of the church manual. And uh, so I met him. He knew me. Uh, we were emailing and appointment was made. I, you know, and then so I met him at church headquarters. And uh, he said, oh, Shituko, we are so sorry. And uh, so what I asked was this. Okay, you guys just gave $3 million to these lo- losers uh, when they gave to church's principal. Instead of, in, you know, reprimanding them, you guys awarded them. I, yes, I'm a victim. So what I asked them was, I lost about $2 million. Why don't you give me back my money? Over uh, clo- it was close to uh, four hundred thousand dollars. So Birmingham University of Hawaii gave me all the account information, the receipt. I had all of the documents that BYU Hawaii provided because the president, all that, they were all uh, with were with me. And guess what? Uh, Elder Brock and told me he said, "Oh, so sorry, Sister Cole. We just don't have that kind of money." When they gave away three million week before to those losers, and they they didn't have heart to give me back five hundred thousand. So what I said was at the time, I'm dying. I am dying because of this lawsuit was baseless, and my I had to spend time and money for this deposition. And uh, and I met uh, Richard Scott personally uh, for deposition. I mean, I was dependent with him, and uh, I thought I was protecting the church. I thought I was, you know, um, uh, doing the right thing as a member of the church. And but they uh, betrayed me. They uh, they didn't care that they, they didn't blink their eyes. So what I what it happened was after I met that had a dramatic meeting. With the other and I came down from the beautiful headquarter building uh, in the lobby. You know, all of the mosaic, all of the painting, all of the statue of Jesus Christ. And then there was a name, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latin Saints. I was just standing on the ground. And then all of a sudden, I go, oh my gosh, this is not the Church of Jesus Christ. This church just killed me. Because my statement at the time to Elder Brockman, who was uh, responsible for all of the intellectual uh, property, was telling me, we just don't have that kind of money when I lost. Janice, did you, I think you just stopped speaking. I'm not sure if you got cut off, but uh, that's a remarkable, remarkable story. If you're still there, what year was this? Did we lose her, Bill? We, we lost you. I can't hear you. Racial, oh, have, racial no, discrimination, have, gender discrimination. She said about 10 years ago. And, yeah. So, um, it, 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 and I am, I, it, you know, good thing that I left the church. At the time, church just killed me right there. There was, uh, I was full of my, uh, full of my own self-righteousness. So I go, okay, you know what? I will, um, you know, it's, it's my fault that I put uh, over $2 million in it. I lost my home. I lost everything that I had for the church. Church did not care, did not blink their eyes. They were busy protecting Richard Scott's reputation because they didn't want to bring him to Wyoming. And these guys are smart enough not to sue them not to sue us in Utah because they couldn't pick the bone there, but they filed a lawsuit in Wyoming. So Wyoming has a lawsuit case uh, there. And uh, one of these days I was thinking, I, I'm busy doing other projects and I'm doing well. And, uh, and uh, the, the great reward is that I left the church. I, I just, it really hit me, it, you know, uh, yeah. how... The church is a packaging, branding beautifully. They're selling Jesus Christ for their own agenda, and people are just, you know, obviously they're all being deceived, and they could care less of what church is doing. They are following being slaves, spiritual slaves, and church has been so successful economically and financially. I paid more, sometimes 20% of tithing because I wanted to be 
righteous. I was extra, the rules and extra I was blessings. A I was a Pharisee for 40, 40 years. I was a temple worker. I, you know, I was a public affairs person for the state. I mean, I did everything to uh, my uh, knowledge for, you know, over 30 years. And uh, 10 years ago, it hit me. After I, so then uh, my joke is, joke of the day is that I gained Jesus Christ for $2 million. So I found Christ after uh, I left the Mormon church. And now I'm true Christian, I believe, and I am righteous in Christ. I don't have the guilty of guilty feeling that church, you know, uh, bind you there with all of the laws, legalism, which is not of Christ. And it, it, they are portraying the light of darkness all over. And I believe the dike is broken. The dam is broken. People like you guys uh, helping uh, outside. Uh, hopefully they'll find some, uh, you know, a peace. Uh, there are fighters outside for uh, truth and the life and, uh, you know, uh, and, and so uh, somehow I actually, I am calling from Korea. I'm working in Korea, but I live in Hawaii. And uh, it happened. It Thanks, happened uh, yeah. in Wyoming. A lot and of so, people are interested in, in hearing more about this story. So we'll have to see if this, if you know, ends up becoming a, um, sure. we can know more about. But thank you for calling in. And I guess what's really sticking out to me is just the, just how much any member has the potential because they do have that implicit trust in the church and in the leaders that when when your livelihood when your house when these kinds of things are on the line you really do think that the church will do good by you and um but when push comes to shove it's it's us that ends up kind of holding the bag i guess at the end of the day and um and so, yeah, so I think Janice is just another example of who really gets screwed uh, when push comes to shove um, when it comes to the church, unfortunately. So I'm, I'm sorry to hear that, but I'm glad that you're doing much better now. Yeah. Thank yeah. Thanks, Janice. Janice, thank you so much. I think yours is an extreme example of what I have found out and what I know that many others have found out is that the church is very happy to take everything that you have to give. But if you get crosswise, with the leadership of the church, you're expendable without a blink, without any compunction on their part. You will be kicked to the curb. You will be yesterday's news and the caravan will move on. Even if the dogs are nipping on its uh, tail, huh? Yep. Mm. Good, yeah. Good quote. I just want to last, my favorite comment of the night here was this one uh, from Lacey. Do as I say, not as I do. And, uh, I thought that do was as I really, say, yeah, not as I do. Relevant. That is a good one because I was I was talking earlier about Sherry Do does this, and I thought if you put that in the past tense, you'd have Sherry Do do, but that probably wouldn't work. What did Sherry Do do? Yeah, for I, you. I don't know. I'm just when I think of Sherry Do, I'm just thankful for the moisture. Okay, I'm not. No, not with a ten foot pole, Mister Real. You may not tempt me. Get thee behind me. Okay. Well, anything else tonight? I don't think so. But you know, something's happening this uh, this weekend. It's Christmas, and I want to wish everybody a very, very merry Christmas. And if if Bill Real playing the part of Tiny Tim can remember his line, it's God blesses everyone. Then he can say it to conclude this this wonderful show. God blesses everyone. 